what does a TPA need to be profitable? Basically, how do they earn money? You know where we're going with it. Yeah. So back when you were charging only, five dollars, I can a day. only refer to the when I was charging five dollars an employee a month. I didn't know how I was making money. You were just happy you had business. That was to be very long. honest about. It, let's talk about it. A three hundred life crew at five dollars an employee a month, and that was total compensation, fully disclosed. Is fifteen hundred dollars a month. Even though it was nineteen seventy five, you couldn't hire a claims examiner fifteen hundred dollars a month. So as a result, all right, I was not making money. I didn't. I didn't jump out of the gate at 100 miles an hour. I walked, and then we cra crawled, and then we walked, and then we, you know, eventually we ran. And I knew that if I could hit a certain target, I could break even. As a matter of fact, I'll, being an entrepreneur, as a third-party administrator, we got we debit our fees from the benefit plan account if there's money in the account on or about the first of the month. So meeting a payroll twice a month on the first of the month was really easy. The middle of the month payroll got to be a little questionable. And truth be told, I had to subsidize for almost two and a half years for my life agency operation. But I had the confidence that this was eventually going to be a business. And then I remember going into my CFO at the time she was at some CFO. She was my secretary, my assistant, my CFO. She basically cleaned the kitchen. She was everything. I said to her, her name was Esther, and I said, Esther, now remember, I've been doing this for almost two and a half years. And I'd come in on about the 12th of the month and say, Esther, how are we doing for the payroll on the 15th? And I was expecting her to say, oh, we're running short, and I'd have to figure something out. And I did figure it out. And if you ask me how, I can't really tell you, but I didn't steal any money. I figured it out. And then about two and a half years into it, I went in. It was about 12, 13. I said, how are we doing? And she said, fine. And I said, what? She said, fine. I said, we can cover payroll? Yeah. I'd lie to you if I didn't say I was let down a little bit. I've been so used to figuring out creative ways to make this thing work and going into my assets. And, go. and then all of a sudden, it was like, the business is in a different stage now. It doesn't need me in the same way. But let's talk about what's a reasonable ROI. Remember, a TPA is a service company. A lot of payroll between 50 and 60 to 65 percent is all payroll expense, leaving you know 50, 35 to 50 percent to cover technology and equipment and all the other things that are involved in a business. If you can buy, find a TPA that's generating up to a 10% ROI, EBITDA, at the, end of the, at the end of the year. And I'm not talking about a TPA with 4 million lives. I'm talking the average TPA that's out there, if you ask them, is probably five to 20,000 employee lives. We're now about 45, I think, or 50,000 employee lives. Members, close to 100,000. Not really two to one anymore, about 80,000. Now part of the, as we are now part of the 90 degree benefit group, we're actually, uh, we pay well over a billion dollars a year in claims as a group, and we have uh, almost about 170,000 employee lives under administration. But let's go back, it's now 2002, 2003, and we have professional societies. We have the Self-Insurance Institute of America, we have the Society of Professional Benefit Administrators at the time. And that's where we all got together to try and learn from each other without spilling each other's secrets. You don't want to give away the secret sauce, but you wanted to find out who, what secret sauce was working for others. There was a gentleman who started a service for TPAs and said, I'm going to send you a questionnaire because your fellow TPAs and your competition isn't going to tell you this. But if they tell it to me and you fill out the survey, I'm going to aggregate the data and get it back to you in a meaningful way so you'll have an idea of standards and benchmarks in our industry. So they ask questions and ask questions about sources of revenue. Obvious one is a monthly administration fee. Another source of revenue was commission on stop loss way back then because there were many stop loss carriers built in 15% commission. The broker received 10 and the TPA got 5. And remember, that didn't have to be disclosed because it was a policy owned by the employer, paid for by, 
not out of plan, plan sure. assets. So this is in the 90s. Then there was rebates from pharmaceutical companies, from PBMs. Nobody really understood rebates or where they came from. It was like manna from heaven, but you got a check, a quarterly check, if you accepted rebates. Some loaded the PPO access fee. There was a TPA, uh, and I can't mention because he's a competitor of mine. I've known him for years, but when uh, PHCS first came out, he was the first TPA to sign up with him, and he got an exclusive for two years, and the access fee was $4.50, and he was charging 10 bucks, and the TPA fee was the So markup of the, mark of the network access fee. Mark, mark up the access fee, mark up vision care programs. My, just mark up, mark up. What about, what about the ones that, that have these shared savings where if they capture savings from it's a, a certain fee. network, it's a they fee. take a percentage of the savings, That's a fee. which sometimes can equate to more than, more than what the, the actual charge would have been. Because even if it's transparent, if I say I'm going to work on 5% of claims, we don't know what claims are going to be in advance. And if, if I were to tell you, we're so good at paying claims, we're going to reduce your claims by 50%. And because we're going to do that, we're going to, well, there's nobody that can reduce claims by 50% without doing significant change and damage. And if I'm going to use 5% of, you know, and, and 50%, I've just gotten a significant boost in the monthly fee, which you don't see. You see the core administration fee. So what, what this gentleman did, he had about 250 or 280 TPAs, of which we were one. We answered all the questions. And he came back, and in 2003, I think is when he introduced the 2002 results, the average TPA's average size account was 280 some odd employees back then. And the average fee needed to break even was just under $40 an employee a month. This is in 2003. I think it was $38 or $39.50. I remember that number. So if you take a 10% markup for, you know, in 15, 16 years, we're at 45. Right. right. So the, the bottom line is, what the, and that's a 280 life group. It has to go up for a smaller group. Sure. And it goes down for a larger group. And that's group. strictly administration. That's none of the other Well, that's stuff. the TPA revenue yep. from all sources. That's not network access fee. That's not... Well, you that's are, the load on the network yep. access fee if there yep. is one. But it's not the cost of the network no, access no, fee. No, no, no. So that's, it's understanding that's a, it is. Because right. right. the Buka will come out at 35 with network in it. Different story. Well, we, uh, because we bought a, our software system vendor in 2002, had the opportunity to buy the company. So we have a software company. It's a coins adjudication company. We stopped supporting other users in 2010 because we wanted to concentrate on our core business. We weren't a software vendor. But with that system, it gave us the ability to work with Taft-Hartley plants who were users of the system. And in 2003 or 2004, Blue Cross of Illinois allowed self-funded, self-administered unions and employers to access the Blue Cross network because their management said, we're never going to get those people as clients. They're self-insured and self-administered. But we could make revenue off them significantly if we could let them access our network. So in order to access the network, their requirement was that your software system had to talk to their repricing engine. So we had a large hundred and some odd thousand member union in Lombard, Illinois, called Lineco. And they were approached by Illinois Blues, which is also in Texas and New Mexico and Oklahoma. And they said, we want your software company, the one we own, to build a bridge. And they're going to pay for it. The software we sold them was three quarters of a million dollars for the license. To get to build the bridge, we charged them a million and a quarter and didn't make any money on it. Not being a software guy, I could not understand it. How can I buy a car for three quarters of a million dollars and then spend a million and a quarter modifying it? It didn't make sense to me. But hey, they did save a million dollars a month on the average for each month compared to their prior PPO once we went live. So we had the repricing numbers for Blue Cross on our, we still do, it's antiquated now, on our system. 
What we found is that on the average between a good commercial PPO and a net Blue Cross network, the difference is less than 4%. In other words, if you look at the deviation, you say, wait a second, all right, they're 20% here, but they're 14% lower here. And collectively, and you look, it's a 4% benefit. Versus original. Versus any commercial PPO. Yeah. Blues have, a, have the best contracts. Now, that doesn't mean they adjudicate claims. That just means that the contracts overall run about three to four percent lower than the rest of the PV segment. When you when you, when you stack them, when you stack them up, put them, them on a no spread. Man manage, no risk management, no proper claim adjudication, price versus price. Right. It's kind of like the PBM industry where it's like, yeah, we get better pricing, but we don't manage the farm. Correct. Same thing. So we move forward with that that software system, and for. Until 2010, when we stopped servicing the employers, we were up to date and we could measure those differences. But now let's talk about how much money does a blues company at the time make on their network. Uh, Blue Cross of Illinois charged nothing for on, on physician professional claims, but they charged 13.5% of bill charges on facility claims. Now, what does that equate to? Well, back then it was roughly 50-50. Pharmaceuticals and physicians made about half, and the other half was outpatient surgery and appliances and all that. So basically you could say their administrative fee was six and a half percent, six to six and a half percent of claims. So if you had a group, an average cost was 10,000 per employee per year, so 100 employees would generate a million dollars of claims cost in that example, and they were making an access fee of 65,000 on a 100 life case. Pretty good margin. So they could say our administrative fee is $12 an employee, $5 an employee a month. They were making 60 to 65 bucks on the other side. And by the way, that's not an administrator expense, that's a claims expense. Is it if, you buy, if you buy that story, it's a claims expense. To me, a claims expense is what Listen, goes out the paper We had a conversation for, with a broker with an employer just as early as yesterday, and he wanted to argue because the fees were higher. He didn't want the the, 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 the RVP vendor fee built in as a fixed cost. He said that claims expense. You can't put it in the fixed side. Okay, so but it's still an expense. Because we, so broke, it, we broke it down as a uh, PEPM, and he didn't like that. Yeah. When you've seen fees, you'll see some TPAs will do. Still and I think I think a percentage I think, of this you know listen percentage. you can go back and forth you can argue I'm not here about individual TPAs some are probably greedy and, and, and build the model or build the model compete with the ASO because it's hard to compete against them to come up with a, a fee and now sell it as a broker or as an administrator it's difficult. So well, they're they, not they, making they, that sixty five in an under life case if you're not making they, sixty bucks on, on giving people access to a network then you're never going to be able so to So they've got to play the game and hide it in other revenue streams because it's what the market's forced you to do. To make they have sale. to hide it, but let's flip to what I said earlier. They have to disclose it. At some point, it's supposed to be disclosed. The penalty for non-disclosure, aside from being criminal, which means jail time, the penalty is you must refund 100% of what you receive from the plan and pay a 125% excise tax penalty to the federal government. So if you were compensated $100,000, you refund $100,000 to the plan, and you pay a $125,000 penalty to the government. Probably non-tax it up, believe Oh, it's not. <laughs> it, you know, it, it's, it's pretty crazy. In all my years, you know, people talk about discrimination and talk about, my gosh, what if my health plan is discriminatory? I can't mention the name of the employer, but we had an employer who had a self-funded plan. His son was not working for the company, except he was an attorney, so he did some legal work for him. Son got into an accident, and we're the TPA, and he's a good account and a nice guy. But he made enough money, he wanted to save as much money as he could, so he said, I want you to pay 100% of the claims that come through on my son's accident. It was in violation of the plan document. This is where employers will make exceptions that are... It's an exception, right. It was for his son, and it was about $65,000 of exceptions. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time, he would never have gotten caught. But later down the road, two or three years later, some employee had a gripe with the plan, some kind of beef, and they sent a letter to DOL. DOL sends an investigator. 
what do they do? They ask for random claims. They come to our office because we have the claims files, and they would bury them in, a, in an office in the back someplace. They say, I want this file, this file. And the first thing they ask for is files of family members of owners of the company. And they discovered a 60,000. Now, what is the potential penalty there? Well, first of all, this employer, thank God, had no problem putting the $60,000 back into the trust, and he didn't mind paying the excise tax. They could have denied the deductibility of all employer expenditures to the plan, basically disqualified the plan as being tax exempt. The reason we have two very well-trained attorneys on our staff is not to protect us. Knock on wood, I have had, in the 45 years I've been in business, I could count on less than one hand the number of lawsuits filed against us that we've had to defend. And in a very litigious environment, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, I mean, I'm in business not that many years, and I've been in legal system loves to sue, so yeah. it's pretty good. We, when we, what we do is we document. When an employer says, I want to make an exception, we explain to them what the exception the risk. is. Yep. We explain, to, and we ask them to sign that they acknowledge that they received the information and they want us to do it anyway. We keep it buried in the file, only for our eyes. And the, because you've got to do that. Otherwise, we don't make enough money to be sued and defend ourselves. We don't have bill, We don't have a legal fee, legal defense fee built into our budget as a TPA. Can't afford to do it. So, if you've seen one TPA, you've basically seen one TPA. And so, you I'm, ask I'm a broker. I'm a broker. I've got business with a TPA. I've got business with an ASO. We've 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 seen a lot of challenges with uh, brokers coming to me and, and they're in, in hell or high water here. So they don't get into it, or at least they're aware of it. What questions should they be asking to the administrator? Are they making revenue here? Is the PBM hiding revenue that they're using? They can even ask the PBM this type of stuff. What are the questions it has? How do they protect well, themselves? I think the protection is if, as, an, as a broker, you're my TPA. Will you be willing to send a email or a letter to me disclosing all of the sources of revenue that you generate from my account so that I can keep it in my file and understand, truly understand, how much you're charging my employer for, and then I can judge the quality of service to determine your value to my employer. It's interesting you say that because we've, we've come up with, in the brokerage industry, they're sending disclosure to brokers, but we yet to, to cross that path with the administrator, so we'll probably work on one. Which is interesting that you brought that up because as I was leaving a prior TPA, I said to him that Eric had taught me about what we're doing and, and he told me some of the pockets that they hide. I said, I, I ripped out the contract and I sent an email to them. I said, please disclose to me over the last two years with my client how much money was made through all these different pockets. It's five months yet. I still have yet to get anything back from them. It, they said it's not a report they can run. It's not a standard report. We don't know. They don't want to show the money that's made. They have a $30, $35 admin fee, but they refuse. They're not refusing. You're, they're you're just, asking they're just dancing them around. to disclose the secret sauce. Exactly. Well, they said you, you make money on this claims review program. So if you pay out a claim in error and you capture the money back, you get a third of it. Great. That's a problem in, 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 in itself, and that's my fault for putting that in place and not knowing about it. But what is the dollar amount that you made from that? And they, they don't want to show. And there's several other pockets. So... What other? I mean, I like. I love the idea of the letter because it also protects yourself of well. Getting remember, some ads. of them are not defined dollar amounts. For example, if you're going to talk about utilization management, well, yeah, you can ask case in advance. Management, you can the say the cost of it. Yeah, yeah, so, so in advance, it's just saying, hey, I'm okay. You're going to make money, but if your fees this, let me know where the rest of the money is. But I'm talking about even even after the fact, and you learn more as a consultant. You're like, oh well, hold on. I need to go check this TPA to see if they're okay before I get myself in trouble. But creating that letter, I would say, is a good start. A lot of people aren't going to like it or want to fill it out. But I think it's a start for transparency from the administration side because we're, we're talking about a big in the broker side. A lot more money is hit on the other side, in my belief, from what I've seen. And I've seen a decent amount ripping through them now with other brokers. See, mo like most employers don't realize that with ASO plans under a PPO agreement, not only does the employer pay an access fee, but the provider pays an access fee, too, in the form of a discount, like a credit card. Talk to me about that. Break that down. All right. 
the uh, provider is supposed to be paid a hundred dollars from PPO. From the PPO, the plan is charged a hundred dollars by Blue Cross Blue Shield. The provider gets ninety four to ninety six dollars. That addition, it's sort of like a, like American Express. When you buy a hundred dollar item with your American Express card, and 4 the retailer pays. There's a four percent discount to American Express. That they, they make, make money. They that make way. money on every dollar. That TPAs do not make money that way. First of all, we don't typically don't own the PPO, and so on top if you of did, you'd have to fee. disclose it anyway. So I mean, so know. on top of the access fee, they're getting its piece of the spread on on the plane. Yeah. What about when you're leasing the network for a TPA? Does it work the same way or no? Well, no. The the only when you're leasing the network, to my knowledge, now Robin's probably more up to date on it than I am because it's been a while since I've been involved in that segment of the negotiation. But you know, when we go to a PPO, we try and determine specifically in facilities that we're familiar with based on our database. How are your discounts at MD Anderson? How are your at various mm -hmm. other places? But they'll just simply say to us, the access fee is this. Yeah. So what, what most employers don't understand, we, we, had, we had brought an employer down and we were talking about where the money is hidden on these ASO agreements because they're making so much money in every pocket. And that's what we're talking about here is TPAs are starting to do it and some probably agree and and some are just doing it to make up to compete with the ASO because they, they've been forced, I think they've been forced into that model because that's what the market wants. So how do I compete with Ibuka if my transparent fee is this? Right? Well, let so, me ask you the question. If you need on a specific group, let's make it $50 an employee a month to break even, what are you gonna do when you have to compete with somebody who's got a $20 fee? How do you you do gotta that? sell the value. Well, I always say- Well, no, well, I'm talking about, I forget value for a minute. How do you compete? You can't. 20 is well, 20, I can only 50 compete 50, the so you've same got way as I 30. Or I more. compete on outcomes, not activity, right? So it's, I'm going to deliver, you know, the cost of everything. You know, the price of everything, but the cost of nothing, as Craig would say. And you, you're focused on the 10% number and not the total cost. And that's my sale. And the value that I'm going to deliver over time is a lower cost, not a cheaper upfront price, right? So. But what, what you see, what these employers don't see is, is they don't realize that they are be, they're pulling money from every pocket. So when they control the stop loss, when they control the administration, when they control the network, when they control the PBM, when they control the case management, cost containment, wellness program, I mean, they even incentivize and give you wellness credits to do the different things we had these groups. They incentivize the employees, give you a $50,000 wellness fund, which of course you already pay for it. Yeah. And then they incentivize your members to do different things that drive up the cost of claims. And these employers think and believe, typically because it's the broker's fault, that these are the right things to do, yet their claims spike every year and continue to go up. It's a phenomenal business model. Oh, yeah. We, we, we like things that are comfortable and touchy-feely. Wellness thing is a touchy-feely. How can you Sounds argue great. against yeah, wellness? Yeah, how could you argue against it? Yeah. Which, which leads me to, you're dealing with a publicly traded company. A lot of people talk in the market. Talk to me about, you, you had mentioned there being mutual companies like with, with life insurance. I've got mutual, we own companies, which is by their policy holders. And that's how they, they were in the past and how it converted over. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, that's what enabled me to get in 2007. And I say me, it was Robin and I and Texas Association of Benefit Administrators. We had been lobbying at the state legislature for some form of transparency for three years. It started with a white paper Hobson and I wrote in 2001-2002. We pulled one section out of it and said that an employer is entitled to know where their money's going. If I'm going to say I sent XYZ insurance company a million dollars, what'd you do with the money? Don't just tell me you got a 28% rate increase. What happened to my million dollars? Why am I not entitled to know that? Because, and I didn't invent that, Mass Mutual was a mutual company. All groups over 50 employees, and I started, and until the HMO Act was passed in 1973, which changed everything, all employers got a record of, we call it a record of operations. It was a P&L. When we went in as a Mass Mutual representative to present your renewal to this 100, 500,000 I had Trans World Airlines. So it was big at that. Howard Hughes. Right. Howard Hughes. Great Howard Hughes. The, you'd sit down and you'd say, here's the first 10 months of operations of your plan. 
The premium you paid was $10,240,000. It was rounded to the dollar. And then we broke down claims as follows. As of the end of the accounting period, through the 10 months, here's the claims that were paid. Here's the pending claims reserve set aside because there's a delay in payment of claims. The claim became the responsibility of the plan at the time that you incurred the claim. You went to the doctor. But the plan may not have seen it for 60 days. It still existed and it's still an expense of the plan. It just hasn't been paid. It's a cruel accounting. So here's your pending claims reserve. Here's the incurred but not reported claims reserve. Pending claims are claims that are in the house. We know about them, we just haven't adjudicated them yet. Incurred but not reported claims, the famous IBNR, incurred but not reported, is a reserve established as a percentage of the paid claims. So typically it was about 40% of paid claims. So if you have paid claims of a million dollars, they assumed that you had IBNR out there of about $400,000. We'd accounted for every penny on your specific account, not on the global business. Then there was a pooling charge, which today in self-funding we call stop loss, all right? Because even employers back then realized that you had a large number of shock claims and it was an abnormal event, not the normal routine, that there needed to be some pooling to share those abnormal events alone, but in a larger group. And we added all those things up and we said, so you paid us $10 million. your incurred claims were $8 million. I'm using numbers. And then we had expenses, just like a P&L. What were the expenses? There were three categories. G&A, General and Administrative Expenses of the Carrier. That's what they paid for their buildings, their That's employees, G&A. the G&A. And they built an ROI in the G&A. They just didn't charge what it really cost. They charged cost plus 10, plus plus 15. Then there was commissions right out there before ERISA, right there. Commissions paid were this. And then there was premium taxes paid to the state because every state gets a chunk of premium or gets a tax on every dollar of premium sold. So every employer had full disclosure in the 11th month when you were doing the renewal of their first 10 months of where the money went. And at the bottom line, it was either a bracketed figure or an unbracketed. You either had a loss or a gain. And it was a mutual company. So therefore, the gain, if there was a positive, we literally would say, now, assuming this carries forward through the last two months, would you like us to apply this dividend All to your next to premium? Yeah. Or would you like a check for that amount? Either one. Everything was transparent. It was open. You couldn't walk this is in. When? This is in 19, well, through ni up to 1973. Now, what happened in 73? Something called the HMO Act, and all of a sudden, Kaiser Permanente, which was the the model for all HMOs, they said we we don't we don't track claims experience. We are, employ all the doctors, so all the HMOs and the health plans said well, we're not going to report claims because we don't. We just have contracts with doctors and we pay them and they treat the people as if they did no cost accounting, which is absurd. So then the fully insured carrier said, well, wait a second, if they're not going to have to report claims, why are we doing it? it puts us in a non-competitive position to them. So it all went away. There was no law. That, there was nothing that said, we're going to pass a law that says nobody gets transparent financial results on it. That's not the case. So when we, Hobson and I wrote the white paper, it was my argument. I said, why can't they do that? How can I get from an insurance company a 28% increase for next year and they not tell me what happened last year because the mutuals had gone and now the industry that was left was beholden to the stock market. Wall Street. That's right. And Wall Street doesn't like delay. They don't like delayed gratification. See, an insurance company doesn't know if they made money on a book of business until usually 30 to 36 months after the first case was written. It's called a treaty year. The treaty year, for example, there's a treaty year, January 1st of 2018 through December 31st of 2018. Well, they wrote a case January, which renewed the next Jan February, February, March, March, April. So the December case didn't renew until December of 2019. And then it's got to run out. So you don't know what you did on that year's treaty for probably 30 to 34 months. Now, how's Wall Street going to report? To the financial Terms, press yeah. that. So the easiest thing to report is 
Aetna increased their market share by 22%. They grew by 22% last year. Wow! Guys, there's not enough business out there to write another 22% of the country. Everybody who's got coverage has got it. So how do you get 22% more? You'll write some new business, but you know if you get a 16 or 17% rate increase on your existing book, it's a lot easier Maybe. to hit that 20%, isn't it? So Wall Street likes sales results. So all of a sudden, you got a 28% rate increase, but they really didn't expect to get that. That was the first stick in the arm with the hot, hot poker. And, and the buyer went, oh, God, that hurts, oh, oh. And then the broker comes back like the hero in the, the, the knight in shining armor. <laughs> Three weeks later, you know, you're lucky you're doing business with me because I talked to Edna. And because I'm a platinum broker with Edna or whatever. Big, I have a big block with them. Yeah, I have a big block. They agreed to 16%. And you go, oh, thank you so much. Still didn't know what happened to your money. But 16 doesn't hurt as bad as 28. So it's, it's, it's the shell game. In 2007, we got House Bill 2015 passed, which I know Aetna, uh, United Healthcare in Arizona, and we tried to get it passed through friends of mine in Arizona. Arizona is a United Healthcare state. It's not a Blue Cross state. They control it. My contact went into the Lieutenant Governor's office, and he called me, and he said, I'm sitting in here. It's me against 18 United Healthcare lobbyists. I said, well, that's a fair fight. So anyway, bottom line is trying to protect the interest of the public and the employer to try and, quote, get some level of control over the insanity that exists in the medical industrial complex, which Hobson calls it, is very, very difficult. And, and now you look at the stock companies, or Wall Street, and what they, you've seen, again, instant gratification is, well, geez, there's this thing called pharmacy. It's going up faster than anything. Let's buy into it, man. Let's, let's, let's buy, invest. and you got every single one of them buying out PBMs. The PBMs. PBMs buying insurance companies now. Well, it really, so it's, it's, it really works this way. The PBM acquisitions started about 8 to 10 years ago. The multiple on PBMs were 10, 12, 14 times dividend. That's That happened. And with, what did that do? That left larger players instead of a bunch of regional players. Mm -hmm. Once you've got mostly large players like CVS and Express Scripts, ESI, what do you do next? What does Wall Street do next? They try to merge the big ones into bigger ones because bigger is better and bigger means less market competition. You border we see, on it, we see it all over in the TPA industry, the carrier industry, the PBM, the brokerage industry. Less competition, bad for the end consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of people out there, you've got the brokerage industry, a lot of people are fighting, coming to the table with Big Talk Online is trying to fix this healthcare problem. And we're in 2019, nobody's figured it out. We think we do. We think that transparency, we think all these things that are out there and newer are going to fix it. And my thought when I have this question come up in seminars, and it's not a popular answer, what I say to them is, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I think human behavior and the buying behavior of humans with respects to other things, yeah, we, I would argue, oh, people, older people are going to use Amazon, think buy things on the door. But I think when it comes to healthcare, their buying behavior is not going to change. And it's going to take 30 years till people that are older than me, even my age and a little bit younger, they're going to have to die. And the newer consumer of buying healthcare has to come in to change it before we see that shift if we see the shift at all. What's your opinion on it? Well, I've learned that uh, there really is no fix or solution to the healthcare pricing problem. There are sidesteps, there's different paths. We've got insatiable appetites as it relates to healthcare services. Everybody wants to live, we want to live as long as we can. We've proven that already, it's breaking Social Security because when Social Security was started, the average male, and actually they broke it down into white male and non-white males, had a life expectancy of 61. Females had a life expectancy of 65. But there weren't that many females in the workforce. You know why husbands die before their wives? They want to. <laughs> but anyway, that's not exactly a good thing to put on. It's a little sexist. But anyway, it's a little joke. Then, a little joke. Yeah, a little joke. Back, little back, then, in the back then, when Social Security also, black males died at 55. 
black females died at about 60. So when they set up retirement, they said, hey, we're not going to have a lot of people reach retirement, so we can fund it. Nice scam. Yeah. Well, what we've done now is now it's quite possible that you will live to age 100, and, and you'll probably be viable up to close to your life expectancy. I mean, it's amazing how we're going to afford that. I don't know, because you're going to require a lot of medical care. Remember, the big hit to health care right now is the baby boomers. 10 million a day coming on to Medicare and coming on to the system a day. And these are not people who are all out there jogging all day and working out. These are people who are couch potatoes watching the, the, the World Series. So they're going to require health care because they want to live. So what you've got is a exceptional demand for services. In fact, the demand is really currently outseeds, exceeds the supply. The doctors we haven't built a lot of new medical schools. Yeah, and, people are going overseas for it. And not only that, but a lot of the state medical societies want to curtail that growth, knowing that there aren't enough doctors. They don't want advanced practice nurses coming into their territory or nurse practitioners. So we have states that say you can have a nurse practitioner as long as no more than X people, X nurse practitioners operate under one doctor's supervision, Within it. I mean, the laws, there's no free market. Under a free market environment, we would have different types of innovation. There is no solution. You know, what is Silicon Valley going to do? I'll bet you they're going to automate the process further. And by automate, eventually, will artificial intelligence be able to go into a line by line claim and immediately evaluate it and kick out the things? that are exceptions, probably. It's not there yet. Now, that will save what should have been saved in the first place by competent administration, right? I mean, is that a savings or is that just becoming more competent well, you get than paid, what you well, do? you get paid to do, which is back to what do TPAs do for that little well, yeah. just It eventually will, uh, yeah. IBM, what's his, what's his the name? IBM, uh, the Watson. Artificial. Yeah, well, yeah, will Watson be able to adjudicate claims? I think Watson could probably do it now it's maybe not perfected, but it will be. Does that have anything to do with the demand for health care services? I think not. You're still going to get to be older, and you're going to get sick, and Watson's not going to be able to do anything immediately about that. Will Watson help the doctor diagnose you? Yes. Better course of path of treatment? Probably yes. But what is the patient going to do? This is all after the fact stuff. We treat medicine here. Remember, we're in a, Hobson probably mentioned this in one of his talks. This country cannot afford a cure. If they cure health care, this economy collapses. We have to treat. We make money treating. We don't make money building a car that lasts 100 years. We build a car with a 3-year, 50 or 100,000 mile warranty and expect it to crap out at the end of the warranty so you'll buy a new one. Well, you said, what was that number you gave me that the cost of medical care is... 60% of your total spend is what? Oh, uh, yeah. 60% of what a, the average human being spends in health care is spent within the last six months of their existence. Fighting. I mean, you'll even see it on commercials. There was that commercial for whatever medication that will help you live up to six months longer. It was, in a top, it was the name on the top of a building in New York yeah. in the commercial. I don't remember what it was. I should. But nowadays, hey, listen. You watch television and you'll see a commercial that says if you go to sleep at night and wake up in the morning, you may have <laughs> and you need oh, 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 Ozampic or whatever it is. The patient, our expectations are I'm entitled to everything available in medical science at no cost and it's the only economic model that I'm aware of where people are so vehement about their entitlement. I don't think everybody go out to the man in the street and say, are you entitled to drive a Rolls Royce? Oh, no, no, I, uh, I wouldn't do that anyway. I want to stretch Prius, okay? But if you ask somebody in the last six months of life entitled to $2 million worth of care, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, it's a challenge of when we talk about it and we look at it, oh, it's crazy not to do it. But what happens is when you get in the position and it's yourself, it's your kid, it's your spouse. It's easy to talk about it if it's not you or your family. You, bro, everything goes out the door, and I think that's what happens a lot of times where it's like, I don't care. Right. And you know, the fall guy in this whole thing is the insurance industry. Now, I'm, I'm a part of it, I guess. 
But I don't think that they should be the fall guy. They're simply administrators. I think they. I think the insurance companies. I say who does it blame? And you can argue. This is my hypothesis. Is we gave the consumer what they wanted. We gave them access to any doctor they want, go wherever they want, copay. We'll stick you next year for it. And we create this facade that you have an entitlement to it. Instant gratification, a, future payback. You pay a premium. You're an I'm entitled. I mean, that's what employees will say on on the consumer on the uh, broker side. Is I pay my premium. I don't understand why this isn't covered. But come renewal time, or come when they have to make a contribution, they're not very happy. So it's well, the insurance it's, industry it's, has it's, never been. The insurance industry has never been good marketers. I'll give you an example. You started in the life insurance business selling ordinary life insurance, right? Sure. I think How most many people have, yeah. lis listen to this PR? How many people want to buy something ordinary and pay a premium for it? Premium means high price. A premium price. And I'm going to sell you something ordinary. You should buy it. What kind of PR is that? If you're going to pay a premium, you should get something that's premier. Sure. Not ordinary. So we've done, the industry has done itself a, a major disservice. And it's also the fall guy. You know, when the PPO puts itself, or the insurance company, by the way, the health, the vertically integrated health plans are doing the same thing. It's going to come back to bite them. When you watch the commercials, Methodist Hospital in Houston is the providers for the Houston Texans. What they're doing, they're, they're simply a facility they don't provide health care. They provide a facility. A doctor and a patient decide on a course of treatment, and they provide the health care through the facilities. But you see, it's not enough to just be a facility. You have to be a health care system or an insurance company in drag. Well, it's big, bigger is better, and we talked about this, and we'll close in a minute on your answer to the fix of health care. Americans want what's called social proof. In today's world, everything is about social proof. Because I don't want to be the first to do it, and if somebody hasn't stood behind it before, then I don't know if I should do it. And we, talk, we talked about Amazon post to the uh, pre-interview. You know, I, I, in one of my talks, I said, who shops on Amazon and shop prices? Isn't it great? What if we were to do that for the healthcare system? And they say, oh, great. Who, how many people would do it? All hands go up. I said the reality is that exists today. You just don't do it. The reason you don't do it is because somebody big hasn't validated and give you the social proof that it works. So well, you don't have an incentive to do it. And I'll tell you why. Regardless of what your financial exposure is, you have an exposure, and making it easier to spend money, especially when it's other people. Let's let's draw an analogy with Amazon. First of all, Amazon is convenient. It's wonderful, and yeah, you may or may not save money. Let's say you save a little bit. Pay for convenience. Okay. It's convenient. It's easy. I probably buy more than I really wanted to buy because I'm looking through and browsing, so it sells well, and they me. know how to upsell you. And they upsell me. That's wonderful. We already have upselling in healthcare without Amazon. Now, what if we had a system instead of, see, I hate deductibles, because a deductible, I'm going to go back, is still a punishment. I pay a hundred percent of that amount that's my deductible. When copays came out in prescription drugs, another thing happened. I paid ten bucks copay for a drug. My drugs cost ten dollars. Nobody no. knew what they cost. They didn't realize that if they went with the same card to Walgreens or to CVS, the plan may be paying more or less, but you still pay ten bucks. I'm wondering from a plan, forget family monthly deductibles and all these, what if all of a sudden we had a plan that said, you're responsible for 25% of all your medical expenses. Oh, we'll cap it, $10,000 a year, whatever. But straight going, sure. it's straight 25%. I can't help but think that the impact on the marketplace would be phenomenal. Why? Because all of a sudden, I want to know what my 25% is. I don't want to know a two hundred dollar copay. I'm responding. If you're charging me a thousand dollars, it's going to cost me two hundred fifty bucks. If you're charging me ten thousand, it's going to cost me twenty five hundred. How much are you going to charge? People are going to start asking questions. That's right. And when people ask questions, the dynamic's going to change, because now it's not some do-gooders out there trying to lobby some people in Congress or.
whatever about it. It's a patient actually saying, I'm responsible for 25% of my bill. Whether it's a $50 bill or a $50,000 bill, all right, I'm capping it at 10 grand or whatever. What do you think would happen in the market? It would be interesting to find out. I've always wanted the opportunity to test it on a relatively large scale. But again, HR people aren't going to like it because it's noise. Providers initially aren't going to like it because they don't know what to charge. You know, what now, card now, now, now we don't know what's going to charge. That's right. You start asking questions. But it's a great way to actually drive the consumerism, which they thought would happen on deductible, high deductible health plans, but it just didn't work. So. Anyway, there are great, great opportunities for, I, I'd wrap this up by saying there are great opportunities for significant change, recognizing there is no solution, you know, ultimate solution. But I think we could make significant progress and change by keeping people economically responsible like the family. They're going to ask questions, they're going to be more motivated to stay healthy, because all of a sudden, i got to build into my budget 20, 25, whatever percent of these costs are. How can I save myself so I can have another vacation instead of spending it at a provider? We don't do that now. I was the only employer. Our plan was a very simple plan, and I think it's worthy of discussion. We had a plan that I wanted my employees to know that for everything covered under the plan, if they could come up with 500 bucks in any one month, their family was protected at 100% for the rest of that month. Not in perpetuity, for the rest of the month. And initially we started off traditionally with copays for a doctor's visit. And I said, well, I don't want to copay for a doctor visit. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this plan on the front end 50-50 the first $1,000 of covered medical expenses in any calendar month. Your drugs, everything, including your drug copays. We had a card, you know, and it was a drug copay. But let's say the drug copay was $100. That was still an expense to your family, so the copay was a covered medical expense under our major medical. Towards the monthly. Toward the monthly, yeah. toward the 100%. So I could guarantee my employees, if you can beg, borrow, steal $500, if not, come see me. You've got 100% coverage for that entire calendar month for you and your entire covered family. It worked. Hobson disagreed with me. <laughs> They're going to abuse it. They're going to. It worked better than my $100 family monthly deductible. Now, it's not a credible example. Sure. I only had maybe 160 members under the plan. We had it literally up through the last year since we became part of 90. But we've had it, we had it for many, it worked great. And my employees, oh, they griped. Hobson griped. He said, what is it? You mean, instead of a a twenty-five or thirty-dollar or fifty, whatever it was, copay at the doctor's office. Yeah. If the, I go to a specialty, charge me four hundred bucks, cost me two hundred dollars. Yep, yep, yep. That's how it works. Is two hundred dollars going to bankrupt? Listen, if you're not going to eat for the month because of the two, come see me. I'll give you a lend you some money for food. It's a mate whether you're inside the industry or outside the industry. An interesting dynamic in the sale to an employer I found over the years. It's amazing. When PPOs came out, a lot of employers, if their wife's ob gin was not in the PPO, they didn't care how much they saved. Forget about it, yeah. Right? I'm not going home and she's going to, I'm not changing my doctor. <laughs> but the plan will save you $150,000 a year on all your employees. Buy your wife a doctor. I can't do it. Can't do it. I don't care. So we're dealing with human behavior. We're dealing with economics. We're dealing with a... Title name. And title, all of those factors. How do you bring all of those? That's the challenge. That's what I love and still love. Loved and still love about the opportunity in the healthcare sector, in the financing of healthcare services, the creativity you can bring to the table. We'll leave it there. Ed Jacobson, founder in trust. Ed, thanks so much. There you go. We'll do it again. Heads up, advisor. We'll see you on the next one.